Hey everyone, it's Governor Sununu. I really hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture. Uh, a great opportunity for the state of New Hampshire. And I just want to take a moment and just talk a little bit about civility in civics uh, and really what it means to both me and I think the people of New Hampshire. The citizens of New Hampshire have always been centered around public service and how to better serve their community. So whether it's asking questions at your local school board meeting or frankly questioning someone who could be the next president of the United States, uh, we take that responsibility very, very seriously. And it's how we really participate. Um, and you see that formed out in the formation of what is one of the most unique state governments in the country. We have 400 uh, representatives. By definition, is one of the most representative bodies of government in the world because we demand that transparency. We demand those personal connections. We really believe that you have to look someone in the eye uh, to get the kind of sense and essence of them before you even get to the policy. And in that way, we create those personal relationships that create accountability and ultimately better management and leadership. One of the things that makes the Granite State most notable, I believe, is the fact that we get stuff done, which you really can't say about Washington, D.C. all the time. Um, there's a real sense of accountability and transparency uh, and the need to always really move the ball uh, down the field and do it in the right way, right? We're not very partisan. We're a very purple state. We're not very Republican or very Democrat. So it really forces us to, forces us to work across the aisle, work with our local communities and make sure that we're listening uh, and creating that sense of accountability. So simply we're just getting the best results for the people in New Hampshire. Hi everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this special event. Thank you to Senator Judd Gregg and Joe McQuaid for sharing your insights and leading this discussion on civic engagement here in the Granite State. And thank you to the New Hampshire Institute of Politics and St. Anselm College for putting together this program that recognizes our state's rich tradition of civic participation. The IOP plays a leading role in fostering discourse and engagement on campus and beyond. Well, I'm sorry I can't join you. I wanted to take this opportunity to share a few words on a topic that I know is important to all of us. As you know, New Hampshire residents take our civic responsibilities incredibly seriously. As we speak, candidates for president are crisscrossing the Granite State, and voters everywhere are testing their mettle and putting them through their paces as only New Hampshire voters can. With a record number of candidates coming through our state, I'm confident that New Hampshire voters will continue to play a pivotal role in our democratic process shaping the national conversation well beyond February of next year. The fact is, our citizen-driven democracy is a way of life here. There are ample opportunities for citizens to step into the arena and make things happen, from town meetings, to our large legislature, to many state boards and commissions. Our government is truly of, by, and for the people. We vote and run for office in high numbers, but we also find other ways to be of use. New Hampshire has high rates of volunteerism and a diverse community of nonprofit organizations that build significant social capital. As a lifelong Granite Stater, I could not be more proud of our rich tradition of civic engagement that recognizes the role we all play in making our communities, our state, and our nation a better place. Now more than ever, as we see so much divisiveness and heated rhetoric, leaders in Washington and elsewhere would be wise to look to our example. That example is one of looking past party labels, scoring points or name calling. It's about hearing each other out and looking for ways to roll up our sleeves and get things done. We all have a stake in that. Thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And I look forward to hearing your ideas about how we can maintain and grow our levels of involvement and participation in the civic process for generations to come right here in New Hampshire. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bailey Sanchez, and I'm a third year law student at the UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. I also serve as the president of the Civic Engagement Society at the law school. I'm happy to be welcoming all of you here tonight to speak and think about this important topic and this important time in history. What makes up the essence of New Hampshire? What role do civics and civility play in New Hampshire, and are they changing? Before we begin today's program, please turn off any cell phones, pagers, beepers, or other devices that make noise. Also, please know that there are two exits, one at the rear of the auditorium and one where you entered. Constitutionally speaking, has been an active partnership since 2012. 
Its goal is to promote civics education and civil discourse in our state. Partners include the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm, the Warren B. Redmond Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service at the UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law, the New Hampshire Institute of Civics Education, the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, and the New Hampshire Humanities. This year, for the first time, Citizens Count is partnering to continue this conversation online on their website, www.citizenscount.org. The William W. Treat Lecture has been a staple of Constitutionally Speaking's programming, featuring past speakers Justice Souter, Justice O'Connor, Nina Totenberg, Eric Liu, Senator Susan Collins, and Boys and Olson. Constitutionally Speaking, Treat Lecture is possible through the ongoing generosity of the William W. Treat Foundation. It is my honor to introduce tonight's featured speakers. Joseph Joe McQuaid is a third generation newsman. His father, B.J. McQuaid, was a founder of the New Hampshire Sunday News, which later became part of the Union Leader, owned by William and Naki Loeb. McQuaid started working at the Union Leader part-time in high school. He became an editor and was eventually named president and publisher upon Mrs. Loeb's retirement in 1999. Before Mrs. Loeb's passing, she asked McQuaid to assist in the effort to open the nonprofit Naki S. Loeb School of Communications. McQuaid was inducted into the New England Academy of Journalists in 2002 and the New England Newspaper Hall of Fame in 2019. Senator Judd Gregg has the unique honor of being the first elected official in New Hampshire history to serve New Hampshire in each of the following capacities. Three terms as United States Senator from 1993 to 2011, two terms as Governor of New Hampshire from 1989 to 1993, four terms as United States Representative for New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District from 1981 to 1989, and one term as Executive Counselor for New Hampshire's District 5 from 1979 to 1981. A leading voice for fiscal discipline, the Nashua Native was Chairman and Ranking Member of the Senate Budget Committee, as well as the Chief Negotiator um, of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act after the recession of 2008. Working across the aisle, Senator Gregg was a key decision maker on several important issues from championing bipartisan efforts to addressing our looming entitlement crisis to improving our health care system and revamping our complex tax system. Following the speaker's presentations, we will have a question and answer period. Please wait for the microphone before asking your question. Now please join me in welcoming Senator Gregg and Mr. McQuaid. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Bailey first off for explaining um, this program and uh, how long it's been going on and its many sponsors including now Citizens Count. With Paul Montrone changed the name from Live Free or Die Alliance. I thought it would have more uh, panache. Um, in a minute, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Senator Gregg for his memories, if any, of, of Bill Treat. Uh, we are here tonight uh, because of William Treat and the William Treat uh, Foundation, which is now overseen by members of his family and others, including, I think, Attorney Casasa may be here. Yes. Um, Upon his death in 2010, a friend noted that Judge Treat brought civility to politics, humanity to our probate court system, and ethics to business. He showed a community, state, and country how one man can make an impact in every aspect of life. Um, I knew Judge Treat uh, slightly through his friendship with my old boss, William Loeb of the U Union Leader. And I was marveling today that uh, about tonight's topics and uh, a time when such strong and disparate personalities as Bill Loeb, Bill Treat, and Hugh Gregg could either get along or disagree, but do so civilly in, in politics. That's in only because we buy advertising. <laughs> that helped. That helped a great deal. Uh, Mr. Treat's long and distinguished career included the law, banking, 
judge of probate. He literally wrote the book on probate in this state. He was a diplomat, proud Republican, appointed by two US presidents to roles with the United Nations, including serving in Geneva on an international human rights basis on a subcommission on the prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities. And he knew Pearl Bailey, which for me is still a, there's still people who recognize the name. Um, at home, he founded the National Council on Probate Judges. He was chairman of the State Judicial Council and pioneered court reform in New Hampshire. So, Senator, I'm guessing your dad probably knew Bill Tree. Well, thank you, Joe. First, thank, thanks to St. A's for putting this together and for the Bill Tree Foundation for underwriting it and for the civics group for participating in it. And thank you for being willing to moderate it. I'm very honored by that. Kathy and I really appreciate the chance to be here tonight. It's uh, a great honor and a privilege for us. Uh, we did know Bill Tree. I didn't personally know him well. You know, I met him off and on. He would actually be at our house with some regularity because uh, he and Vivian were good friends of my father and mother. Uh, my, I do have a recollection of him that's pretty uh, interesting in that <clears throat> I didn't know him well enough to know what he'd done, you know, that the extraordinary things he'd done in his life. And one of the first people to get in touch with me when I was elected to the Senate was Bill Tree. And he called me up and he said, I want to continue to have my official passport. I said, what's an official passport? And <clears throat> well, there's this little passport they hand you if you're a member of the government that's called an official passport and it allegedly gets you through places faster, although Kathy and I can tell you a story where it got us through places a lot slower. Um, but it, it, I thought to myself, well, he's not in government. Why should he have this official passport? And then I, I started reading about him. And what you just outlined is only the tip of the iceberg as to what Bill Tree did uh, in his life to, be an, to have an impact on the everyday existence and betterment of the nation, not only the nation, but the world. As was mentioned, he was uh, a leader in the United Nations in, in fighting discrimination. And I said to myself, wow, what a citizen of the world this person is. He deserves a, he doesn't, shouldn't have to have a passport, period, but let's get him the official passport. So it was one of my first acts of constituent service, I got him an official passport. But a really extraordinary person who epitomized what, what makes New Hampshire work, which is civic, civ civic involvement and a commitment to doing better for other people, not for himself. Yeah. Amazing guy, and as was Vivian. Vivian was a force. Yeah. Well, when we asked Senator Gregg um, to be here tonight, he said yes, he had only uh, two requests. One was that the topics include uh, what is the essence of New Hampshire, which I will be asking him in a moment. Second was that I repay him the dollar <laughs> yeah. that he claims I owe Finally. him. From a, from, a golf, from a golf match. Finally. So, so we're off and running. With interest, but I didn't oh, get that, the interest. No, in it. It's coming in installments. Um, this guy, by the way, did have an awful lot to do with saving the country in the big recession of 2008 by working over party lines to get something accomplished. It's an interesting story, actually. You know, tell it. It's an interesting story because <clears throat> I think everybody in this room, maybe some of the students weren't impacted by it as dramatically as everybody else, but in September of 2008, uh, this nation stood on the precipice of the largest depression in the history of the world. And uh, I'd been asked by Mitch McConnell, uh, I was chairman, ranking on the budget committee at the time, but the senior members of the banking committee who should have been negotiating the issues with the House membership, with the Democratic banking membership, and with uh, the President and Hank Paulson had gotten into some sort of tiff. And so uh, Mitch McConnell came to me and asked me if I would negotiate on behalf of the Senate Republicans uh, how we were going to work an agreement. And Hank Paulson had gone up the weekend before to meet with with uh, Speaker Pelosi and had given her a one-page outline of what he needed in order to address what he saw as a crisis of incredible proportions. Uh, a couple days later, uh, <coughs> Speaker Pelosi gave him back a 275-page bill, which is what she wanted. 
And so this was what was being negotiated. And <clears throat> little progress was being made when I was called in Thursday of that week to try to help out a little bit. And I really wasn't too much up to speed on the specifics. But that night, Kathy and I were downtown at a black tie dinner. I hate black tie dinners. This one Kathy really liked. It was at the National Gallery, and it was sort of fun. So about 9 o'clock at night, on Thursday night, Mitch McConnell called me. And he said, I need you in the Capitol in 15 minutes. And I said, great. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy didn't mind me leaving because she was having a good time. And so I went up to the Capitol. I went into the room off the, off the Senate floor, room S19, 119. And in the room was myself and Barney Frank from the House, and a guy named Spencer Backus from the House, who was the ranking Republican on, on banking. Uh, Chris Dodd, who was chairman of the, of the banking committee. Uh, Chuck Schumer, who was the senator from, from uh, New York, obviously. He wasn't a senior member yet of the leadership. And Ken Conrad, who was chairman of the budget committee and was my, uh, was my counterpart on budget. And about two minutes later, after we'd all gathered uh, around this small table without staff, uh, Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell came in, which was very rare to see them together. And they came in, and Harry Reid said, in about five or 10 minutes, <coughs> Chairman of the Federal Reserve is going to be here, and the Secretary of Treasury is going to be here. And you need to listen to them, because we need to get a deal, and we need to get it done quickly. So about five minutes later, the chairman of the Federal Reserve came in, along with the Secretary of Treasury, and they sat down. And uh, the chairman said, if you don't give Secretary Paulson what he needs, within 72 hours, the entire banking system of the United States will fail, and then the entire banking system of the world will fail on top of it. And we will have the most severe depression in the history of this world. This was a very sobering event to say the least. Uh, so from then on, uh, we negotiated continually through the night, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday. Uh, Secretary Paulson told us, if we don't have a deal by Sunday, when the Asian markets open, that it's game, set, match. We won't be able to get ahead of the curve. And so very late on Saturday night, and another interesting story, but I won't get into it now, it's too long. Uh, we reached an agreement, Saturday night, about 12.30 at night and uh, closed the deal and produced what was then known as TARP. As a side point, I asked, I was the only negotiator at the time for the Republicans because the House Republicans refused to participate until late Saturday. Uh, they didn't want to get involved in spending all that money. And I, and I asked Hank what we needed, and he said, I need $700 billion and I need total flexibility. And the House and Democrats were being led by by Barney Frank and the Democrats in the Senate were being led by Chris Dodd, and they didn't want to give total flexibility, obviously. They wanted some strings here as to what was going to happen when this money went out and what was going to happen with them. I assumed we were going to have lots of strings. But I said to Secretary Paulson, how did you come up with $700 billion? And he said, I was driving up to the hill, and I was going to ask for $300 billion. And remember, this was when billions meant a lot. Mm. We, we, weren't, we weren't in the trillion level. Yeah. And then I realized we need a number that's so large that nobody in the world will think that they can short the American banking system because they'll be taking on the American government. Mm -hmm. That was the linchpin of what kept the world from going down, that one decision that he made and the willingness in the end of everybody at that table to reach an agreement. I will say one other thing about the negotiations. They went on, as I said, continually for three days, two and a half days. There was never an ounce of partisanship, not one ounce of partisanship in that room. There was a lot of disagreements, and they were really intense, but there was no partisanship. Everybody wanted to get it done. And uh, it was very impressive. Government worked. It's uh, what people from New Hampshire do. Now, uh, Bailey was nice enough to uh, recite your curriculum vitae, three times US senator, congressman, governor, son of governor, executive counsel, lawyer, and, I might add, lifeguard? Hampton, lifeguard. Hampton Beach? No, Wallace Sands. Wallace Sands. Never went in above my ankles, it was too cold. <laughs> but with the possible exception of that last, what qualifies you to talk about the essence of New Hampshire? Uh, 
I, actually, I'm not qualified compared to you. I mean, let's be honest. There's probably nobody in this state who knows more about what has happened in this state over the last 50 years than you do. And if, you, if I were to play a Trivial Pursuit game with Joe McQuaid and New Hampshire was the topic, I would lose. I don't think so. Which would shock me, I but I would. So. <laughs> but on a serious note, what do you think makes up the essence of New Hampshire? And do we still have it? Uh, or is it going away? What's your sense of what makes up New Hampshire to be the unique place that it is? Well, Kathy and I have talked about this a lot, actually, over the years. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, but I think the base upon which it's built are the people hmm. who are committed to being involved and trying to do better for the people around them. And it starts in the community where we have this concept of local control and where you have selectmen or select persons now who are just willing to do the job of making a little town work for a big city alderman or all the person. Uh, and I think it's people being willing to get engaged to try to make it a better place. I also think that the size has helped, that you can have a huge impact here as an individual. If you're in New York or you're in Illinois or in California, you don't think you're ever going to have an impact on anything. But here you've got an imp you have an impact. If you take on an issue in this state as a person and you have the energy to follow through, the odds are you're going to have an effect on it, uh, which is very important. Also, I think that <clears throat> the land is important. I I've always felt, and I've said a lot, and most of you in this audience have heard me say this, that in the, the Mark Twain quote, which is that in the South, the people define the land, but in the North, the land defines the people. And our state is, we have such a unique, fabulous environment with our mountains, our rivers, our, our small towns, our, our just our forested areas, that, that really defines us as a culture and gives us a certain outdoorsiness, but it also gives us a respect for things that are bigger than us and maintaining and protecting those things. So I, I think those combine. You've got to throw in the government, which I think is really unique and historically unique. You know, we don't, unlike most states, our government is, is totally different. I mean, we have an executive council. So the president, governor of this state basically has a board of directors who, when you're governor, I, when, when I was governor, you couldn't spend more than $1,500 as governor without getting three votes on the executive council. Now I think they got up to 5,000. They've really become spendthrifts <laughs> since I left. But, um, and every contract goes across that table of any size. It's over. And so there's never been a major corruption scandal in this state because it's all public. I think the council's a, a tremendous plus, and it, it's a holdover from colonial days. And every other, every other state which had a council, and the 13 colonies all had them, they've basically been abolished. Massachusetts has one, but it has virtually no power. They appoint, I guess they review judges. Secondly, the legislature. Having 400 legislators, one for every 3,000 people, you know, people make fun of us, but it's great. Everybody's a citizen legislature in that legislature. You get paid $100 a year. I mean, it's a great way to approach things, I think. I think having a two-year term for governors, I know that gets a lot of grief, especially from governors. But <laughs> I, 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 I think being clo tied that closely to the electorate is very important. And you know, the only governor who's ever gotten past three terms is John Lynch. I saw his picture up there. It's John, Governor Lynch, right over there. And he's the only governor who's ever gotten past three terms. Eight years. Yep. So it, I think it's pretty, that's a pretty good explanation of the fact that people in New Hampshire want a governor who's there for a, a brief period of time, does his, his or her job, and then moves on. Uh, and so I think that's a plus. And we have all these little quirkiness, you know, the governmental quirkiness. The fact that the department heads aren't coterminous with the governor is, I think, a huge plus because you get these really professional people in these departments, and if they aren't any good, they they come up every so often, but as governor, you got to work with them. And usually they're incredibly dedicated civil servants. Incredibly, you got people like Bill Gardner. What an extraordinary resource that person is for the state. And, and so, I, I, of course, he's appointed by the legislature. But you've got, you've got other folks that uh, have terms that exceed the president, governor or who aren't coterminous. I think that's good. So it's a lot of little different things, but what it really comes down to is people, people who are willing to engage, do things, make their 
town better, their state better, their community better. Now, you and I are an exception. We're, we're a minority. We're from here. Most everybody else is from somewhere else. Does that play a role in what makes up New Hampshire immigrants in the past and people today coming from other states? Well, I think no question about that. Kathy came from Boston, so I mean, that's space. We upgraded the state a lot. Yes, sir. yes, yes, they did. That was your grandfather. And um, <laughs> playing Trivial Pursuit, there was quite a scandal in uh, the late 1940s, just before your dad got in as governor, where the, uh, I think the Secretary of State, uh, his name was Steve Story, and he was doing a deal with a Manchester contractor named Cody without benefit of bids or going before the council and it was up in the millions of dollars. And because of the New Hampshire Sunday News, which is how the letter comes up to Kathy, um, they were exposed and they both went to the slammer. And Good. Then, and then your, then your dad came in and it's been clear sailing ever since. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the politics of the place. Does the New Hampshire presidential primary play a role in the essence of the state or is that well, as you know, because you, you've been around, and Tom Rath and some other folks, Chuck Douglas, been around a lot, George, uh, been around through a lot of primaries. It, it really has grown rat exponentially over the years. And the first major primary, well, the primary started in, I guess, the 30s. But the real one that got us our sort of our recognition was the Eisenhower primary in 52. <laughs> And uh, Sherman Adams was governor. And Eisenhower was the commander of NATO, I think. And Howard, Robert Taft, who was Mr. Republican, was running for president, wasn't it, Robert yep. Taft? Yep. Uh, and William he, Loeb was backing Taft. Taft, yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, uh, I won't say anything. So, <laughs> uh, so um, Sherman Adams ran a writing campaign for Eisenhower. And that started, Eisenhower won, went on to get the nomination, of course, to be a president. And then it sort of built on itself. And probably the one that really, I think, kicked it into an even higher gear was, it wasn't the Kennedy one, which was important because Kennedy was local, but it was the one, and I saw a picture of it here somewhere, Rockefeller versus Goldwater in 64. And what people don't remember was that Rockefeller ran against Goldwater and Harry Cabot Lodge won on a write-in. And he wasn't in the country. He wasn't in the country. He was and the ambassador to Vietnam. Eisenhower was not in the country when he won in 1952. But the Democratic side that year was just as pivotal as the Republican because the president right. was Truman. And Truman wasn't going to enter the primary because he didn't think it was worth anything. A guy named Estes Kefauver came up here from Tennessee with his coonskin cap on, a real pretended to be a, a corn ball. Um, and beat Truman, and two weeks later, Truman said, I'm not running again. And then he president. got beaten by Adlai Stevens. Yeah, well. For the nomination. Uh, no, Truman didn't even go no, for the nomination. No, but I mean, Kefauver did. Yes, Kefauver did, yeah. yeah. And then, but, and, and then the Kennedy pivotal came. one, I think, on the Democratic side was when McGovern ran against uh, Lyndon Johnson, the sitting president, and c got such a huge vote uh, that pushed him out. Um, 1968, and, 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 and you, you never know that this won't happen again, but Eugene McCarthy was the oh, senator, Eugene and he had all the, uh, the anti-war kids camping all over the state. And while he didn't win, and Johnson was a write-in, and Johnson won it, but Johnson took a look at those tea leaves and two weeks later announced that he wasn't running again. McGovern was... 72, he also lost to a guy named Muskie, but Muskie had some kind of, I don't know, tear, <laughs> tear duct thing or something going on. For the you know, younger people, this was, this was in front of his eye and the union leader calls it crying. Well, I've, I've Water since outrage. discovered, I've since discovered that in 1960, the night before the general election, there was a rally across the street from the union leader and a presidential candidate got up, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, there may be a worse newspaper and a worse publisher in this country than the union leader and William Lowe, but if there are, I can't think of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> he 
His name was Jack Kennedy. I think so. That's pretty good. That's pretty good imitation. <laughs> well, we don't have an accent in New Hampshire, so we have to. So we have to add one for the for the uh, uh, Boston people. So we have politics, the, the big legislature, a, a weak governor's system, the geography of the state, which is interesting. That was one of the areas that I jotted down. How. We're a little state. We have all these different places, including Harrigan's North Country, which is another world. How do they, you know, you said, Twain said in the South, the people define the land up here, the land defines the people. How so? How, why is that the essence of, of New Hampshire? Well, I just think it's their size, you know, and the character of, of, our, of our land. And we have historically marched to a different drum than the rest of New England. Uh, I used to describe us as the entrepreneur, as the, as the refugee camp for entrepreneurs. I mean, we always had people coming in from Massachusetts. And Steve Merrill coined the phrase, uh, he was a governor here. You probably don't remember. <laughs> he wanted to be here tonight, but he was chasing a bat for his wife and fell down and broke two ribs. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, he should use a tennis racket. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Anyway, he coined the phrase New Hampshire Advantage. But we have always been more of a laissez-faire, free market, go out, take risks, create a job type of atmosphere than our sister states. And, and of course, we always made a lot of money off our sister states selling them liquor under a laissez-faire, <laughs> create jobs approach. And um, that character, I think, is, has, has started to mute, I have to admit. I, I don't think we're quite so quite so uh, eccentric in that context. It's eccentric is the wrong word, but we're, 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 we're lining up more with our sister states in New England. But that was always a differentiator. And I think that brought people here who wanted to be differentiated. You know, it, if I found when I was governor and in, 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 in the Congress that, you know, a company would get a group of people in Boston or around Boston would get to a certain site, usually spin-offs from MIT or, or Harvard, technology people, they get to a size of maybe 10, 15 people, and they run into the Massachusetts government, and they say, I can move 30 minutes north and not have to deal with all this excess. Yeah. Uh, and so the type of folks who came into the state for a long time were very entrepreneurial. And I think that uh, had an impact. Uh, you didn't mention something called the pledge, yeah. which is a pledge that most candidates, a lot of candidates for governor have taken over the years that they would veto a broad-based sales or income tax. Has that lack of an income tax, therefore, a smaller no, government? I should have mentioned it, because it is, it is core to the character of the politics of the state and to the definition of the state as, as it sees itself relative to uh, how much government it will have. You know, <clears throat> all government moves left. All government moves left. The rate at which it moves left is determined almost entirely by the number of revenue sources. Think of it as a train. And the more revenue sources you put on the train, the faster that government moves left. And so by restraining revenue sources in this state, we have restrained the growth of government uh, to something that's functional. Uh, we still lead the country in all sorts of different areas, health care, mental health care, uh, all sorts of areas, police protection. We've got two or three towns in this cities in this state that are rated in the top in the country to live in. And we delivered, there was a really good study done a while ago now, but comparing Vermont services to New Hampshire services, New Hampshire services came out way above, whereas Vermont tax burden came out way above. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a function of taxes, essentially, that gives you better government. It's a function of people being engaged in the way your government functions. Uh, but one of the ways we've constrained the rate of growth in this government in New Hampshire has been to constrain the revenues. Once you put in a sales tax or an income tax, government explodes. Every one of our sister states at one time, in my lifetime, and in your lifetime too, because you're even older <laughs> than I am, but um, had either a sales tax or an income tax, but didn't have both. Maine, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. Vermont, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Every one of them went to the alternate, to the next tax. They either went to a sales tax or they went to an income tax, with the representation to their constituencies that that would reduce the other tax. 
Well, maybe reduce it for a little while, but then it starts to grow, and they both grow, and, they, and the natural inclination of legislatures is to spend money if they have it available to them. And so they both have very heavy, they all have heavy tax burdens. People argue that our real estate tax burden is heavy. It is heavy. But if you compare it actually to our sister states and to places like New Jersey, it's, it's below norm. So I think not having, the pledge I think has had, played a major role in keeping our government size controllable, and as a result, the quality of government has had to occur without expansion. We're going to... Uh, that may be a conservative view. Well, it's okay. Uh, we're going to veer in a minute to uh, the topic of civility and civics, which Martha, Martha Madsen from our uh, Civics Institute is very much interested in. Um, and by the way, I should have told you, you're being taped. This, this is being taped by the new... Well, I wouldn't have said all those nice things about you, Joe. I want to withdraw those. New Hampshire Institute <laughs> of Politics, which his dad had a lot to do with, is uh, taping this. There are also, we have letters from Senator Hassan and Senator Shaheen, and two short videos from Governor Sununu and Congressman Pappas, because that's what they do these days, is videos. And they will also be up uh, on the site. Um, you wrote a piece about national spending in the government in the Hill column. Uh, recently, and I'm wondering what kind of uh, civil responses you got <laughs> from from people who might not agree with you. Well, I think you know, and I think most of the folks in the audience understand that we've changed the whole, we've changed the essence of political dialogue in this country fundamentally. Uh, and it's social media. Uh, social media has kind of huge and wonderful things for us as a people and for the world. I believe, but one of the negatives of social media is it has given a disproportionately loud megaphone to people who are on the fringes, people who believe in conspiracy, people who are energized by hate, people who have very marginal views and have very stovepipe approaches to issues. And so I th people ask me, what's the problem in Washington today? I have a couple of thoughts on it, but one right at the top of my list is the fact that social media is drowning out thoughtful and intelligent conversation on issues which are complex. And the government of the United States, when it was structured by Madison, was structured to be a consensus forcing government. We're not a parliament where you take control of the government and then you can do whatever you want for five to six years. We are a government that, where everybody has to be pushed together. This was a whole Madison's whole concept because he was extremely fearful of autocracy. And reach consensus and then govern. And that's why you have a, three branches of government and you have two legislative branches and you have a Senate where the minority has a, has a disproportionate voice through filibuster. And that's being eroded, that ability to reach compromise, which is the essence of our ability to move forward as a government, by the fact that social media drowns out thoughtful discussion on complex issues. If I, that article I wrote, or any of the articles I write, because I try to make them reasonably controversial just to make them interesting, uh, you'll immediately be attacked from all sides uh, in a very vitriolic way. And it's true of anybody who tries to put forward a complex, on a complex issue, a, a thoughtful discussion. Uh, everything has to be very targeted, thumbnail and usually filled with lots of pejoratives. And, and I, I, think it, I think it's really undermining our capacity to govern as a country. Um, but the parties don't seem to want or be able to do much about it. You don't get a lot of pushback from people such as yourself saying, wait a minute, can it be discussed civilly? I see that John McCain's widow, her foundation has now started uh, a hashtag about being civil mm -hmm. was announced on the anniversary of, of his death. Is there a place yet for civility, or are we all too <coughs> sensitive? And should McConnell be Moscow Mitch? <laughs> well, first off, the parties have been fundamentally weakened in our system. They, they really have been, you know, 
they've been undermined by the capacity of people to go over the party so easily through tweets and through uh, the internet. And so the party discipline has just dis dissipated radically. That may be good, it may be bad. I happen to think that it's undermining, again, a very important part of getting consensus, because the first step to consensus under our system has been to have a two-party system, where you either have to gather as a Democrat or a Republican, no matter what your ideology is, you're liberal or conservative, you've got to get under that one tent, and then you start to be pushed together until you reach consensus as a party, and then you join the, the discussion at, at the congressional level, at the federal level, or at the state level on the issues that you disagreed on, but you have at least started to focus efforts. And, and so as the parties dissipate, it's going to be much harder to reach consensus. And I think one of the worst things that could happen is if we ended up like the European system where you've got all these different parties. You've got the Green Party, you've got the Alphabet Party, you've got the Beaver Party, you've got the Zebra Party. <laughs> and, and everybody gathers in their own little stovepipe, and they don't go out of it. Uh, and so you can't ever reach consensus. And that's what you're seeing in Europe today, in Brexit especially, in, Europe, in London, in England. So I, I think our two-party system is an important element of our ability to govern. Uh, as to civility, I'm hopeful. I, I think it's, it comes down to leadership, basically. I mean, people, leaders have to be willing to be civil. And they have to reject people who aren't civil, and they have to I always used to say, and when I was in the Senate, and we'd have these caucuses, I'd say, you don't reach agreement on these complex issues by stepping on the toes of the Democratic Party membership, because they expect you to do that anyway. You step on your, the toes of your party and make it clear that agreements have to be reached in our party in order to cross the aisle. And uh, I don't see the leadership. The uh, Citizens Count Group um I don't know how they came to this conclusion, but they've said recently that they've done a study of the New Hampshire legislature and that it is now more partisan than it has been in quite some time in terms of the votes down the line, Democratic or Republican, and never the twain so meet. There are 400 members. You would, you would think that that would be uh, overcome yeah, I, I think that's a probably, that study is probably accurate, by the way. Uh, when you had this legislature two years ago, it was Republican, and I think it was extremely partisan, and this legislature is a Democratic and is extremely partisan, and they are voting for initiatives which are really at the fringes. Uh, they're really uh, ideas that come from their base, and they're forcing them through without compromise. Uh, again, I think it's an issue of leadership. I think you've got to have people in the legislature who understand you go across the aisle uh, in order to, to govern. You can't govern a complex country or a complex state from one position. Uh, it just doesn't work. You mentioned um, uh, civics and a sense of how the government started and what Madison had in mind with the branches and having to get together. Um, Martha on the New Hampshire Civics Institute uh, Facebook site uh, posted an excerpt today from a book by Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. He has a new book coming out. It's the Ben Franklin quote, a republic if you can, if you can keep it. But in there, interestingly, he says about civics education, and I want your sense of where civics education is these days. He says, for us, civic education and engagement are not just ideals. They are indispensable. As Jefferson put it, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, civics is an essential part of learning in our society because our society is governed by people who are private citizens moving into government. And, they, and you have to understand the way the government works and what the importance is of being involved in it. You know, in, in New Hampshire, in the fourth grade, you study New Hampshire government. And it's sort of fun to see these kids come up to the state house and wander around. Of course, when I was governor, the governor didn't have the bathroom. So I'd have to go down the hallway and I'd go into the bathroom and there'd be 20 kids from the fourth grade in there with me. <laughs> 
but that's the way we should keep it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I don't think we carry that through our system with aggress aggressively enough. Just reinforcing what it is, what are your responsibilities as a citizen? To vote, to understand who you're voting for, to understand issues with a little complexity, uh, to at least know who you represent you. I mean, I, I saw some studies that show just a disproportionate lack of knowledge on who their people are that represent them, even at the federal offices, oh, which are highly visible. Gorsuch cites a, a recent study by the Annenberg Foundation that no, no more than one-third of the people in this country could identify the three branches of government or, or, or the political parties. Or get when the Civil War was or how it came out or who the winner was. And, I mean, it's pretty startling. Well, I had, a, I had a burning question from one member of the audience tonight who wanted to know if, if Kathy McClellan's great-great-great-grandfather was General McClellan in the, in the Civil War. Of course I he would, was. Of course no, he was. I wouldn't think so. He was, he was he not that good. Yeah, he got right. fired. He, That's right. He had an A in it. Lincoln once asked if he could borrow his McClellan's army. To go, <laughs> That's right. To go fight.